Okay, here we go. I, I've been trying to make this video. Uh, one of it got one of the a form of this video was stricken down by YouTube, taken off for a violation of community guidelines. And uh, truth is not a community guideline on some of these platforms. But I, I wanted, you know, I was always trying to connect what's been happening socially and politically on planet Earth with with what's happening in the solar system. And we we most definitely do have an ongoing extinction. And <clears throat> I will say this again and again, it's not the sixth major extinction. It's not going to be because after the passage of this brown dwarf, after we clear out the cosmic rays, there will still be ice left. So, and the, you know, we're going to be hard pressed to have any ice, you know, a um, few hundred years from now. And our ice extent is even lower in Antarctica than it's ever been as of we speak today. And, you know, people always focus on Antarctica, but, you know, it, it kills me how we have two ice caps and those denying climate change don't want to look at the Arctic. <laughs> They just want you to look at the Antarctic, and I find that a little, a little strange. Um, the, but I don't think we're going through the sixth major extinction, uh, mainly because I, the cause. And you know, if we take a huge impact, in some ways, a huge impact may block out all this crazy radiation that we're getting. And my last video I made it very very clear uh, with many charts and graphs some of them you've already seen before but but mainly when I make a video I think about the, the subscribers families and how can I put together videos that they could forward to concerned family members and friends without being ridiculed or condemned and so I try, so I do reinforce a lot of concepts, reinforce a lot of data. I keep putting it up and the powers that be do not like that, that it keeps showing its ugly head, the, the databases and the graphs and the charts and, and, you know, and the facts. And, and so, but if we were going through a six major extinction the, the reason I don't believe we are is one because I think we're going to come out of this with all our ice still not as much as we need and not as much as we want but by the same token um, we're still going to have ice left um, losing all our ice would be catastrophic especially with respect to methane so so but I wanted you know there's so many weird things happening on planet earth and all along I've said over and over again, we should probably fear mankind before we fear the solar system. Well, the solar system right now demands respect. I mean, we're bleaching the coral, we're aggravating drought, we're record evaporation on the water, um, record oceanic temperatures. So uh, it, it's, it's quite astounding what the heat is doing. Uh, South facing trees, uh, are taking a hit south side of the some trees are taking a hit it seems like watering does help over watering almost helps um, sprouting new new plants in soil that's 120 degrees does not happen and will not happen but it's it's after the 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 plant sprouts and you get leaves and chlorophyll it seems like they're more resistant to the to the solar radiation, but but we have so we have to respect the solar system. You know, if you walked into a dentist and the dentist said, "Well, I like to give your child five times the X-rays that he needs to, to X-ray one tooth," you would probably choke the dentist. But we're not talking about five times X-rays. We're not talking ten. We're not talking a hundred times. We are talking, excuse me, we are talking a hundredfold increase in x-rays. That's, I mean, that's, that's almost inconceivable. It's almost hard to fathom what a hundredfold increase 
in x-rays means and how it would even happen. But when you have a million more particles per you know, cubic centimeter, um, and those particles have all the electrons, and, the, and those electrons get exchanged and ionized, you, that's a lot of radiation in the solar system. Mil I mean, you, you have billions of particles, extra particles per cubic meter. So that would light up the corona of the sun when these particles reach the corona. That would enhance auroras on all the planets, and that's what we're seeing. And I've showed you picture after picture, beautiful auroras now and on planets where Hubble never saw the auroras, and now Hubble sees the auroras. So you can't say it's improved, you know, observing. That we just couldn't see these before. We have uh, dozens and dozens of new moons around the gas giants. I mean, all that's public history. But how does that pertain to what's going on in the world today? What problems can we solve right now in this video? And if you can solve a major divisive problem in a 30 minute segment on a one hour video or a one hour radio show, um, then that would pretty much drive home the fact that nobody wants a solution to the division, that the division is welcome and that it is organized and that is planned. You know, instead of rallying the troops around a common enemy, a lot of the conspiracy channels have drawn, drawn very decisive and very obvious political divisions. There's always a discussion of Republican versus Democrat on a journalistic website. You know, you're, it's not journalism if you're expressing and promoting your own political beliefs. It's like having it's like having Walter Cronkite preach to you about his religion and how you should join his church. I mean, you, you leave commentary out of journalism. And, and you can draw conclusions based upon data. You can draw a hypothesis. You can state opinion. This is my opinion. But to drive home over and over and over again how bad the liberals are and how bad the Republicans are in, in a conspiracy channel um, is throwing people way off. You know, here you are talking about the uh, New World Order, the Illuminati, global, 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 and then when things start going south, it's not their doing, it's the Democrats or the Republicans. I mean, there's a huge departure from the narrative. And they just slip it in there. And it slipped in there almost every single telecast. Almost every single one. And, and so, so, if, you know, we have to kind of follow logical progression. If the elite knew we were going through a, a minor extinction, then they would be planning to come out on the other side and with complete control of the earth. This would be their opportunity. They have all the money. They could have all the bunkers. They could build underground cities. They can control the Pentagon. They can control other governments. They control the banking system. I mean, these people are in complete control of media. Um, <clears throat> look it up. You know, there's a, some debate. Nine to 12 individuals control all media on planet Earth. So if you think the Billionaire's Boy Club, they don't get together, uh, you're sadly mistaken. Look up the Council of Foreign Relations. Look up what the Illuminati, Illuminati are. Look up what the, the G summits are. I mean, look it up. Um, and, and so when somebody wants to blame something on China, when somebody wants to blame something on Russia, if we look at it as a global government, then all of this would have to be orchestrated. The war on Ukraine orchestrated. And what leads me to lean that way is timing. You know, how is it we come off an unprecedented un pandemic, we experience unprecedented drought, we, express, we experience unprecedented food shortages and supply chain disruptions that go way beyond the COVID. 
now. How is it that all of that happens at the same time we have an unprecedented war, um, it's just unprecedented immigration, unprecedented division, unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. Do you think that's all a coincidence? You're pretty naive, and it may all be a coincidence, but to fail to explore the fact that it's not a coincidence, failure to do anything that is investigatory, failure to read what other people are saying, um, I, to me, at this point in your life, would be very irresponsible for, especially if you have family. And so, you know, we look at what's happening on planet Earth with respect to culture and social and political divisions, and we see a world, not just a country, we see a world that is so divided and the hate has crept in. Now, now, when we talk about the people who got the shot, you know, if I were to talk to people about, about what happens with the shot, people who have got the shot will not listen. The, the conversation's over. And in the thing is, is people who have no medical background will argue with somebody who does have medical background. I mean, that's like, I mean, I don't know anything about construction. And I would never go up to an architect and argue with them about anything because I have no professional or educational background on that topic. I'm completely illiterate. So when somebody wants to talk to me about messenger RNA and they want to tell me I'm wrong and they have no background at all, no biology, not even, not even uh, biology 101 in college, right? And they're telling me how wrong I am. There's something, something just seems way, way off. Somebody sounds really brainwashed and controlled. You know, and, and Kerry Maudé, Dr. Maudé, said, uh, you know, that the graphene oxide can self-assemble and, and transmit and receive information. Information that is beamed through microwaves. Well, th that's, she's describing 5G. So if you have a 5G ce cell phone, it's possible p to, to monitor your, you personally. They have an app on your phone right now. If you have a phone that you bought in the last three years, th they can access three, four, maybe even five apps that you would not think would do this, but they can tell through those apps if you're walking or running. That's it. That's the app. To tell whether you're walking or running. Why would you need five apps on somebody's phone to tell if you're walking or running? Well, if you turn off that app and this app and that, they can still tell if you're walking or running. So if somebody's trying to throw you in a shielding center, a, a hotel, um, a retreat that against your will, Mm, it would help to know if you're running. <laughs> the the um, so you know, and none of this is theory. I mean, it's all there. I mean, it, this is all factual. And when I do propose theory, I try to differentiate from what theory is and what is fact. And sometimes I don't do a great job in that. Um, but most people know the difference between an opinion and something that's a statement of fact. But it is a fact we are divided. We are divided along more than one uh, division. The, there's a religious division, uh, especially uh, surrounding abortion. There's a political division and hatred like we have never seen before. I have never seen the level of hatred as I have seen. And the people who are doing some of the most hating are people purporting to be Christian. We're we're God-loving. Well, what does God say about hate? Um, and judgment. Um, and then there's the division that's racial. And, you know, and again, I've addressed this a few times, where we were actually coming out of um, a race, we were doing racial healing. We, there were, 
interracial marriages were at an all-time high. We were electing people to Supreme Court or appointing people to Supreme Court. We were electing people that were minor minorities. I mean, we're, we're really blurring that gap between racial division. And then all of a sudden, the critical race theory comes up, and now, now we have it thrown in our faces. And what they've done to create division is they started putting out false information, in my opinion, that we should compensate the descendants of victims. And, I mean, that's a whole new precedent. And we've compensated for some of that through, through quota, quota hirings. You had quotas for med school. You had quotas for college acceptance, where people who may not have the same GPA will still get in ahead of people who have higher GPAs just because they have a quota. Well, that quota is trying to balance things out, but it's not payment. So when all of a sudden you, you promise a whole race of people um, payment for what their great, 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 great grandparent went through or their great, great, great grandparent went through um, or a distant cousin went through and you promise them or say, we're going to try to get you money. What that does is it sets you up to hate the people who keep you from getting that money. And there's no legal precedence and there's no legal basis for the just compensation. Because um, you can't go back and undo history. You can only learn from it and make sure it, these mistakes never happen again. And grow as a, as a more perfect union and as more perfect people and a more perfect community in a spirit of togetherness but here we are you know I, I, I heard a, a lady during registration a black lady ripping on a guy who stood too close to her and it was because of his white privilege but yet in the, while she was opening her mouth she was exhibiting the same prejudicial intolerance that we were fighting in the first place. Black people weren't allowed in the front of the bus. They weren't allowed to eat next to white people. Now, white people aren't allowed to stand next to black people now because of their white privilege. So, um, it, I mean, it's, it, don't buy into it. Don't buy into this. Turn off that TV set for a good month, two months. You'll, you will not die, I promise. So, so what, what I would like to do is solve one of those divisions and show you how easy it can be if somebody really wants to solve these divisions, how easy it can be. So I'm going to, in the next 30 minutes, solve the abortion debate. It's the hardest thing to talk about because you're talking about a sexual issue and you're talking about what social reengineering that is happening now with the transvestitism, the wokeness stuff, the transgender uh, stuff, the, the homosexual stuff is being normalized. And, you know, normal and typical are, are two different words. And I would say that homosexuality is atypical it, you know, you're in a minority, but I would not say it's abnormal because they found that um, a lot of gay people have different structural changes in their limbic system and their brain. So they're born that way. And, but there are some people that are conditioned, brainwashed, manipulated, and confused. There, are a, there is a percentage that is that, and I know this because I've worked in adult psychiatry for a, quite a while and adolescent psychiatry. So, so I, I feel that, that we can solve that problem right now. We can solve the abortion and gender identity issues. We can identify what the clear, what the clear motive is behind why they're doing it now. I mean, it's not a coincidence that all of this is happening. 
all this unprecedented stuff. Now government wants to come inside your house and tell you how to raise your child. But, so the abortion debate and division really does address a sexual issue, but so does the gender identity. So we're going to try to solve all of those issues right now. Um, there's a guy who does a conspiracy channel. His name is Stu Peters. I like him better than Alex Jones. I like him better than Mike Adams uh, because Alex and Mike have a very strong propensity to divide us politically. Uh, they're always expressing a political opinion. I don't think they can make a telecast without doing so. There's always blame being cast on a party and they diverge and stray from that which got them their notoriety in the first place and it's the globalists. It wasn't the Democrats that got them their notoriety. It was teaching us about this billionaire group of boys that uh, I call it the Billionaire Boys Club. And, and these elite that control everything, you know, the Bill Gates, the, the Rockefeller, the, the Nobels, the Carnegies, uh, the Koch brothers. I mean, th th you're, you're talking about billionaires. And there's very few billionaires. You're talking about leaders of other countries. You're talking about Putin. You're talking about China. They're all billionaires. And they want to protect their billions. And so it doesn't serve a billionaire's purpose to have a whole lot of war because it damages the infrastructure you built. and it, uh, it uses up the money that the government needs to run a government. Um, but war is profitable. Um, again, the, most prof the people that made the most profit off the Iraq war was the banking system. So, I mean, look it up. When you, mail, when you loan $2 trillion at interest, that's a lot of interest, and the principal hardly ever gets paid back. So, so you, people say the military-industrial complex makes money. Well, yeah, they do make money. Millions. But the, all that stuff was purchased with borrowed money. Um, so, so it, it becomes it becomes very very important that we differentiate um, what is actually happening. And Stu Peters, uh, when he talks about the gender identity, the wokeness, the the normalizing of transvestitism, transsexualism, the normalizing of homosexuality, to to who to our children now, right? Um, that's, that's really stepping on some very private grounds and if you don't think it's orchestrated and if you think it's all by accident you have to ask yourself well why is the FBI getting involved with school boards? Why such a heavy hand? So that's telling you that all of this is coming down from above. All of this directive, all of these narratives are coming down from somebody. And Stu Peters, this is his opinion and it's hard to argue with him. He said that all this gender normalizing is an attempt by the pedophilic Luciferians in the elite structure of the world hiding the damage they have done. Hiding the confusion they have caused. By normalizing and by misidentifying the gender confusion that goes on with some people. Just because you have feelings that may identify with feelings of women and you're a man, just because you share same feelings as a woman doesn't mean you should cut off your body parts. And nobody has a right to take that confusion and misrepresent it to you. So we're going to straighten that out right now. We're going to deal with that. And this video is probably going to get struck down. But we're going to solve that problem. We're going to solve the abortion problem. We're going to address these issues at a psychiatric level. So let's get started. The 
First thing I wanted to say is there's certain principles that we are not taught and we need to be taught. If we were taught these principles, there would be less unwanted pregnancies and less gender confusion and less victimization of young people, of children. If these principles would just get taught at an early age, the entire world would be better off. I want to remind you that what causes an abortion is an unwanted pregnancy. People who want to have babies, they don't go to an abortion doctor, they go to OBGYN. So, so it's unwanted pregnancy. So if you, for every unwanted pregnancy you prevent, you, you know, a percentage of those are going to end up in abortion. So by preventing unwanted pregnancies would have a greater impact upon the number of abortions being performed. The, the problem we're seeing is that there's a contradiction in the political system. You have these people that are, ooh, anti-abortion, anti-abortion, but meanwhile, fetal stem cells and cord blood is, is fast becoming a billion dollar industry. And where do you get fetal tissue from? Oh, from the one cell line they're growing? No, you, you can't grow one cell line and have it turn into a billion dollar industry. You need hundreds, if not thousands of different cell lines. So everybody has their own stem cells that they can then sell. And stem cells are the answer. They are the answer medically to, like, if you have a heart attack, uh, you can inject stem cells in a feeder artery or a feeder vein and regrow heart tissue, which is unheard of. But now you can. You can, you can actually repair damaged heart muscle with stem cells. But, but, so there's a contradiction going on. And I just wanted to call your attention to it because it raises a lot of questions that you should be asking. But we're going to go back now to unwanted pregnancies and the gender identity issues. Like Stu Peter says, that they're trying to cover up their, their damage that they've done to young children. In fact, they're, they're not even, they're trying to change the way that we even address or refer to people who um, predate upon the young. Now they're not child molesters. They're people who prefer, you know, I don't know. I, I've, there's a term now for it. And it, to me, I find it disgusting. But they're trying to normalize it, to hide their criminality. And, and when people commit murder, they c commit murder premeditated for very few reasons. One could be monetary, but the other is to protect your criminality. If you're going to be exposed as a criminal and looking at life in prison or 15 years in prison, that's, that's a heck of a motive to silence somebody. And so, so it becomes easier if we just normalize the behavior. And as long as we're in a society where sex is taboo, premarital sex is taboo, and people who pertain to be Christians seem to forget about the story of Mary Magdalene. You know, it, it's funny how they forget that story when they try to tell you that you're going to go to hell for, for, um, you know, premarital relations. The and 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 nobody has a right to condemn anybody to hell. The Bible says only one person can condemn you to hell. Only one entity. So well, if somebody tells you you're going to go to hell, they're they're actually becoming God themselves. It's, it's very, very narcissistic. But, so what happens when, when we, we address sex, the first and most important thing is that we need to teach everybody that human touch is the most important form of communication in the world. That, that, um, I could put my hand on your shoulder, and just by the way I touch your shoulder, you're able to identify what I'm feeling and thinking. My touch can be reassuring. My touch can be therapeutic. My touch could be controlling. My touch can be angry. I mean, there's, 
It's the most important. When babies are born, if they're not held, and, and it's not just about rocking, it's about being held. If they're not held, their brains can't even develop. Their brains will not develop. And so, you know, when, when that happens, the children grow up with all kinds of neurological problems, which lead to behavioral problems. So that's how important touch is. You know, look at primates. Th they hold their babies more than we do. And so it's, it's, it's important that we teach this. Touch is the most important form of human communication in the universe. You, I, I could be an extraterrestrial. I cannot speak your language, but by the way, I touch your shoulder. You'll know what I'm thinking or feeling. Um, so if we would teach that from a very early age, people would think twice about how they touch people. Number two, the other thing that needs to be taught, because this leads to the gender confusion, is the concept of the autonomic nervous system. And this is all factual. The autonomic nervous system is part of your nervous system that responds automatically. That's why they call it the autonomic nervous system. Your heart and your breathing are, when you sleep, you don't voluntarily breathe and you don't voluntarily control your heartbeat. That's controlled automatically. Hormones controlled automatically. So there are parts of your body that when there's physical, how do I say this? There's, I don't want to use this word stim, but when there's a physical experience to certain parts of the body, autonomically it increases blood flow to those regions. And it's not always their erogenous zones. It's, it's many parts of the body do this. Respond to touch with increased blood flow. If I lay my hand on my arm right now, the heat of my hand will increase the blood flow to that area. That's autonomic, automatic. So nobody has a right to use that automatic nervous system against us to get what they want. And here's the analogy you need to share with your children. And, and adults need to know this too because they're living in a confused state. And, and so you're 10 years old and nine years old and you're sitting in front of a car, you're on the driver's seat and you're pretending to drive and there's keys in the ignition. Well, you know you don't touch those keys. But then an older person comes in reaches in the car, turns the key. Well, you know the key is not supposed to be turned, but the car turns on anyway. And then it lurches forward. It hits a pillar. The pillar crashes down. The other guy says, shh, don't tell anybody. Don't, I'll get in huge trouble. Please, please don't tell anybody. Um, I love you, I love you. You know, don't hurt me. But then the parents come out, and you're the one sitting behind the wheel. So now... What a confusing situation. But that's what the autonomic nervous system is. It's, it's an older person coming in and involuntarily turning the key to the car that they're not even supposed to be touched. So a person who's not even old enough to be driving yet. That's a perfect analogy. Then as you get older, here's another, the same analogy, but let's just go, you're 17, 18, now you're of legal age, okay? And, and you hate your work. You hate it. You don't want to go to your job. Pulling up in the parking lot makes you feel sick to your stomach. And you turn the key to your car, and no matter how bad you want that car not to start, it starts. What does that mean? It means your car is healthy. Your car is working correctly, at least the starting part. And so... That's your autonomic nervous system. If, if you have a physiological response to touch, the most important form of human communication, if you have a physiological response to touch, it doesn't mean you wanted the car to start. And it doesn't mean anybody has a right to reach in your car, grab the key, and turn it. You cannot consent to that as a child. And so 
if you experience an autonomic response, it creates confusion. It creates confusion because the child thinks, well, I didn't want this, but it, this, I had responded anyway. Or, you know, children look up to adults. So children seek attention. Children live with fears and needs. Well, the adults have all the power. I mean, look, this is the third principle that needs to be taught between older and younger people. Older people have the power to manipulate, the power to lie, they have more knowledge, they have more manipulative skills, they have the power to threaten uh, and intimidate, they have the power to threaten abandonment. Um, they have a power to create fear of conflict. Meanwhile, the child has needs and fears. Need to be accepted, need to be loved, fear of abandonment, fear of conflict, fear of being hit. And the need, 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 need to be accepted and loved. So what a huge power difference. So if, if you don't say the word no because you're afraid, um, that doesn't make you a participant. Because your card started up doesn't make you a participant. And that's where the confusion comes in. People confused that they actually, you know, enjoyed it when mentally they didn't that they wanted the car to start, even though they didn't. They really didn't want the car to start, but it started up anyway. So, so that creates tremendous confusion. So nobody has a right to go to a confused individual who, who feels like a participant and not like a victim and tell them, well, the reason you share the same feelings as a woman it's because you need to be a woman. You should be a woman. And that's what's happening. And, and um, if you, I mean, there are shows out there. there are, there's been stuff on 2020 and, uh, you know, these Dateline shows where they've interviewed people who've gone through the surgery and never got counseling. And we see that there's a high depression and suicidal ideation amongst people who get the surgery and do the hormones. And at that point, I would venture an opinion that counseling is not going to help you anymore. Because you've cut off a body part and it's hard to go back. You've maimed yourself. And you've listened to people who are doctors telling you, you're a woman. Even though you look like a man. So then, that would cater to somebody's confusion. It would misguide them as to what their feelings are. It would make it harder for them to sort out the feelings. So you hide the autonomic nervous system. You hide the power differentiation between adult and young or old and young. You hide all that and just say, well, if you're a guy and you, you, you think you're attracted to some of the men, it means you're a woman. You should dress like a woman. He said, we should parade in front of my children. A man in woman's clothes. Well, I've worked in psych. I've worked with a lot of transsexuals. And they end up in psych. What, what are they in psych for? Suicidal ideation. And when I work with these people, there is a strong pattern of denial. They do not want to be called by their original names. But the other thing that I noticed amongst transsexuals who are suicidal is that they had a very strong religious background and homosexuality is a sin. And it's shameful. And so how do you split from that shame is you say, oh, I'm really supposed to be a woman. Now your feelings are normal. Because you're a woman. So that confusion is made worse by what they're doing right now. So, so, but if you don't teach these principles, if children don't know, then they'll become less and less equipped to deal with the issues if that happens to them. They'll be less, uh, they'll have lesser ability to resist and say no. 
they'll have more inhibition to come forward if something does happen. But if you teach these principles, they will be brave, braver, they will be more educated, and they will be more likely to come forward. But, so we're trying to solve all these issues. So, what, what real, and if somebody wanted to do this, they could do this, and this could be done, all of this stuff could be taught. Instead of handing out condoms, they could be teaching this stuff. And when I had sex ed in high school, it was how to have sex safely. And, and it, I never saw it as protecting. I, I just saw it as almost a useless class. And, and it, it, you know, handing out condoms, I mean, which I think is a parent's job, I mean, it almost seems like it's encouraging sex. So there's a lot of confusion amongst these people who are victims. And when we teach these principles, they will be more empowered to see themselves as victims and not participants. And they would not mistake an autonomic response for, for something that, like, I actually enjoyed this, you know. Um, I actually wanted the car to start. I must have wanted the car to start because the car started. So we get rid of that confusion. But if we had basic laws and rules that are taught at a young age, lines in the sand we can never cross, then then it would be easier for us to make choices because even adults struggle with what's moral, immoral, what's, what's perversion, what's creativity, what's, I mean, they struggle with that. And so basically five basic rules can be taught that if you never cross these lines, you're good. And the acronym that I use is SNAKE. <laughs> no, no, don't go there. SNAKE is spelled with a C, not a K. But um, we used to teach these to the adolescents when they leave to help them stay healthy and, and non-pregnant. Number one, S stands for safe. Safe against disease safe against unwanted pregnancy. That's the number one rule, it can never be broken. Don't cross that line. As long as you don't cross that line, your sex is going to be healthier. And that's what this is about. It's about healthy relations, not unhealthy ones. And it means you care about yourself. It means you put yourself first. And it means that if you never cross that line, um, you'll, be, you'll be more on the side of not getting pregnant. Because after all, unwanted pregnancies are what cause abortions. And while we're on this topic, if all those anti-abortion people, all those pro-life people, and if you want to be pro-life, it's a free country, be pro-life. But I, I prefer people be pro-solution and not take sides that we are pigeonholed into by the official narratives coming out of that little black television screen. But it's important that we understand that all that energy, all that money, all that time spent on trying to prevent abortion, if you would have spent all that time, money, and energy on preventing unwanted pregnancies, you would have prevented a heck of a lot more abortions. You would have, you would have made a huge dent in the abortion numbers. You would have prevented far many more abortions than you already have. But, and that's a logical conclusion. Because you're preventing the things that cause abortion. I mean, that's a problem-solving thing. 
And I want to say one more thing about this issue before we go on to the next letter and the acronym. No woman on planet Earth has woke up, looked at the sunrise, and said to themselves, Oh boy, I get to have that uh, abortion I've always wanted today. Okay, that, that doesn't happen. These women are alone, they're confused, they're hurting, they're desperate, and they're afraid. So if you think turning that woman into a criminal is a solution to the problem, you need to go back and read your Bible. Read the story of Mary Magdalene. And see if Jesus made her a criminal. Number two. N. No lying. If you're telling a lie to have sex, it's unhealthy sex. Lying hurts your own self-esteem. Lying makes you have to tell more lies. And once you start that rabbit hole, you just dig, dig it deeper and deeper. If you're lying to somebody or you're hiding something from somebody, chances are you're not going to be having healthy sex. Chances are you're going to be having unhealthy sex. So let that be a rule. No lying. And these are rules you never cross. These are firm lines in the sand you can never break. And you're taught this and it's harped on you at a very early age. And, and you know, and when, when we talk about safety, you know, there are alternatives to intercourse. And it, it's a touchy subject because the righteousness of people get in the way of their logic. But there are many things that can be experienced, very creative fashions, that are alternatives to intercourse. You know, bowling is one of them, but in terms of intimate encounters, I mean, the sky is a limit. Use your imagination. Use your creativity. Have fun, but keep it safe. If you don't have protection, you don't need protection if you don't have intercourse. So, sorry, I had to go back. But so, safe means also using protection or using an alternative, and no lying. Don't tell a lie to have sex. If you're lying to a, a, another person, or you're lying to the person that you're having an encounter with, that's unhealthy. It's unhealthy for you. And it, it, it kind of creates a dysfunction around the topic. And then there goes your, there goes your protection, and there goes everything. A is age appropriate. When age inappropriate, encounters happen it's confusing both to the older person and the younger person but mainly to the younger person so keeping your your encounters age appropriate you know the the person has to be of age of consent but also it's got to be done so that it doesn't create confusion in the adult or the or the younger person as we get older, that age differential changes. It, it becomes smaller and smaller. You know, you could be 30 years old and be with an 18-year-old, but when you're 60 years old, it, it, the age difference isn't quite astounding, and it's not as inappropriate. But if it's going to create confusion, or if it can get you thrown in jail, that's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. So don't cross that line. I mean, there's very few rules. This is five rules. And you obey these rules, and so many things would change in our country. Age appropriate. C stands for consensual. Okay, if, if you're giving somebody alcohol, you're slipping them a Mickey, um, you're coercing them, you're using guilt trips, you're using your size and strength, you're using your, your power to gain an encounter, that's not healthy. Remember, touch is the most important form of communication. Remember that always. And consensual means consensual. And if people were taught these five rules, those, those that pretend to be non-consensual 
but yet are still being seductive, will not give off those confusing vibes. They will not be confused themselves. They will be able to make deliberate choices. Yes or no. Um, and if they're not ready, they'll be empowered to say, I'm not ready. But you cannot withhold information. You cannot coerce. You cannot use guilt. It has to be consensual. And that means a person has to be of age of consent as well. And that leads right into E. E is to express how you feel. Again, this comes back to touch being important. Now imagine this scenario. Every time you touch somebody, you're trying to communicate how much you want to please them, how much you care about their feelings, how much you really don't want to cause pain, how much you want them to enjoy the touch, how, how much they, you want them to trust you, um, and you're there for their fulfillment. Now imagine that other person doing the same for you. Imagine how giving and how bonding those encounters can be. And every therapist on the planet will tell you um, for a healthy adult relationship, that part of your relationship should be healthy too. The healthier that is, the, the more trust you have. The more trust you have. The more, the stronger bond you have. And and how can that be a bad thing? Imagine how wonderful if you were never taking and you were always expressing and your partner was doing the same thing. Well, if there's any guilt or confusion around the topic, it's kind of hard to use E to express how you feel because generally you're seeking immediate gratification and you're not trying to express your feelings. You're trying to fulfill a need and not trying to express your feelings. And that sets us up for what? Unwanted pregnancies. That sets us up for inappropriate, unhealthy encounters. That's only five rules. That's five. That's not very many. And you don't break those rules ever. And the sky is the limit. Have fun. But never, never, never cross those lines. Teach that at a young age. Drive it home over and over and over again. And your child will respect you for being honest and for being clear and for being clinical about a topic which no other parents talk to their children about. They're going to feel special. They're going to trust you. And if something goes wrong, They'll have the ability to trust you with, with, with an information, with that information. They will trust you in their disclosure. They will trust and, and, and run to you if something bad happens to them. Otherwise, if you create shame and guilt around the topic, you may never know your child's been a victim. So you can just see in the last 20 minutes how if we were just taught these things our abortion rate would come down because our unwanted pregnancies would come down. The, our children would be more empowered to, be, to not be victims. And if they are victims they would be more empowered to feel like victims and not like participants. And if people really wanted this solution, if they wanted a solution to this horrible epidemic of trafficking and, and um, prostitution. If, if they wanted a solution to this unwanted pregnancy issue, there are real solutions. And I just touched upon some of them. The other solution to abortion that never gets addressed is improving the adoption option. Many people carrying a baby to term and then abandoning it at birth is almost as much as a sacrilege as getting pregnant in the first place. And, and that's a hard thing to do, to ask a woman to carry a baby for nine months and then give it away at birth. 
that is not a very fun obligation. If you were to change the rules of adoption, if you were to regulate adoption agencies tighter, if you would, you know, review and inspect those agencies on an annual basis for compliance with the law, the adoption would become a cleaner environment. But one of the things that would help the woman go to full term is knowing that down the road that child has a right to come look for you. And that you have an obligation still, even though you're giving it up for adoption, you still have an obligation as a natural parent to see that that child succeeds. And therefore, it has to be written in your contract that somewhere along the line in that child's life that you need to participate in this, that child succeeding. If you have an addiction problem or you're an alcoholic or you have a mental illness, you know, that's different. Then in order to get involved, this is where the adoption agency comes back into the picture and goes back and interviews the original parent and see how healthy they are. And if they are, by contract, that child has a right to come knocking on your door and you have an obligation to open that door and help that child succeed in life any way that you can. So you're not abandoning your child at birth. You're just having issues that keep you from raising a healthy child and you care so much about the child that you, that you will make that sacrifice temporarily until you get on your feet. And, and by adoption agreement, the adoptive parents must explain to the child that they've been adopted. They can't pretend to be the new parents or the real parents. They have to be truthful so that nobody feels betrayed. Nobody feels lied to, nobody feels deceived, and those people that now look at the adoption option, it looks a little more pleasing because you're really not allowed by contract to abandon anybody that you've given birth to. That person will have a right to look you up at any time and be part of your life. Supervised visits, that's up in the air but at least you're not abandoning anybody. So then the shame and the guilt associated with carrying a baby and giving it up for adoption is removed. So then the adoption option becomes even a, a more viable option for those people with unwanted pregnancies. Well, there you go. There you go. Problem solved. Problem solved. So you see, problems can be solved. And it should become obvious to us all that people doing finger pointing aren't solving any problems. And either you want to believe a finger pointer or you want to believe a problem solver. Which one would you choose to believe? And, and so knowing that we are headed for a, a, a pretty significant climate shift that's going to make it very hard um, to grow food, make us more dependent on government, less self-sufficient, less healthy. Um, knowing that's coming, these guys have positioned themselves to come out as kings and queens on the other side. The problem is, is the extinction progresses slowly, too slow for their liking. And, and as we enter into this extinction, th that's the time they're making their move. And I have always said that you know when we're coming towards a climate catastrophe, you'll know by the behavior of government. And you'll know by the behavior of men when that day has arrived. Well, that day has arrived.
And if you just look around and open your eyes and quit buying into what they're selling and, you know, quit, you know, put your cell phone away from you so the 5G doesn't transmit, you know, get away from the TV for a while. Start reading a little bit more. Listen to what the opposition has to say. And understand, when you look around, that the division is unprecedented in almost every realm. The economic separation, the, the, the middle class is now becoming the poor, <laughs> the poverty line. So rich and poor, that's a big division that's getting wider every day. Religion. You know, the, again, the religious stuff is very divisive. Uh, churches in um, amongst themselves are divisive. Their church is the right church that you should be going to. The, and it's not a knock on religion. Then there's a difference between religion and church. And in the Bible, Jesus referred to the people in the churches as heathens. Just thought you might like to know, Matthew 6. So, the, the whole idea and notion that the division has been manufactured, that a lot of what's going on in politics is just to show, to suck you in and get you riled up. I mean, they did this with World War One. They did this with World War, uh, with the Vietnam War, they did this with the Korean War, they made you afraid of communism. Our own children. You were willing to condemn our children to die on a battlefield over a fear that was created by a narrative, and who fed you that narrative? Food for thought. Thank you for listening.